we begin our second week, hopefully you guys have um, gotten into the swing of things. Today is actually our review of chapter 11, which means then um, you will have review homework today. And then on Wednesday, rather than having a video, you will have a test that I will send to your email address or to your um, texting link. Um, so we're going to work our way through. My suggestion to you would be, as I'm putting problems on the board, I would pause the video, work through the problem, then come back to the video to see if you got the answers correctly. Um, on section 11.1, .1, we began to learn how to simplify square roots. So we would have something like this, um, maybe this, and maybe something like this. So you might want to go ahead and pause it, work these problems out, and then come back. Like I said, that's what I would suggest all the way through the video. On this particular problem, I can look at this as the square root of 4 times the square root of 7. In order to get that out from underneath the square root, I have to literally take the square root of 4. The square root of 4 is 2, so the answer here is 2 on the square root of 7. If you have a square root that can be broken down, you must do so. It's like reducing a fraction of lowest terms. This one is the square root of 4 times the square root of 15. So that's 2 on the square root of 15. Yes, 15 can broke, be broken down to 3 times 5, but I can't take the square root of either one of those, so it doesn't do me any good. Now let's say you have something down here. I can't break either one of those down, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is multiply them. So that gives me the square root of 18. But then I look at 18 and I go, that can be broke down. That is the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. So that's 3 on the square root of 2. So that's your final answer on that one. Alright, then we added in some variables. So again, I'm going to put them up there. You might want to do them and then come back to the video. On this particular one, I can look at 20 as the square root of 4 times the square root of 5 times the square root of a squared times the square root of b to the 4th. Um, this one is 2. Square root of 5, I can't do anything to it, so I'm going to leave it underneath the square root. Now remember on variables, I haven't understood 2 there, so 2 times what is equal to 2? Two? 2 times 1. So I have an a to the first power. 2 times what is equal to 4? 2. So I have b to the second power. And they both come out even on that, so I don't have anything left underneath the square root. So the answer to that problem would be that. Down here, I can look at this as the square root of 9 times 5. So the square root of 9 is 3. I can't do anything to the square root of 5, so I'm going to leave it underneath there x squared, 2 times what comes plus to 2 without going over it? My answer is 1, so I have x to the first power. 2 times what comes close to 5 without going over it? I have y squared, but it doesn't come out all the way to 5, so I still have a y underneath here. 2 times what comes close to 8? 4, so I have a z to the fourth power, and that's my answer on that one. You also learned that you can't have a square root on the bottom of a fraction. So, like if you have something like this, the square root of 2 over 10. That means square root of 2 over the square root of 10. But I have to get rid of that 10 because it can't stay underneath the square root. So, I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of 10. So that's going to give me the square root of 20 over 10. But then I have to look, can 20 be broken down? And it can. So you should have the square root of 4 times the square root of 5. So it's 2 on the square root of 5 over 10. And then that can be reduced down to 1 over 5. So I have the square root of 5 over 5. Um, 
We also did one where I had a binomial on the bottom. So let's say I have 3 over 5 minus the square root of 2. I would have to get rid of that square root on the bottom, but I can't just multiply by the square root of 2 because when I distribute the square root of 2, I would have it with this 5. So I have to multiply the top and the bottom by its conjugate. On the bottom, I have Florida, so I just do first, and I do last. The square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is 2. On the top, I have to do distributive property, so I have 15 plus 3 on the square root of 2. So when I do that out, I have 15 plus 3 on the square root of 2, and on the bottom, I have 23. If this number, this number, and that number could all be divided by something, I would have to do so to reduce it down. Alright, section 11.2, we started adding and subtracting these. We also multiplied them. Um, so, take a second and do that problem and then come back. Okay, that would give me 6 on the square root of 5. We talked about how if the square roots were matching, you almost look at it as a variable. Um, let's do, let me put up a couple of other problems and see what you can do on these. And then we'll come back. break down 50 into 25 times 2. So I have 3 on the square root of 6 plus 3 on the square root of 2 minus 5 on the square root of 2. I can break down 24 into 4 times 6, so that's 2 on the square root of 6. Well, you'll notice these two match up and these two match up. So that's 5 on the square root of 6 minus 2 on the square root of 2. Alright, down here I have distributive property. Remember, you multiply what's underneath the square root together and what's on the outside together. So you can look at that and go, there's an understood 1, so it's 1 times 5, or 5, and it's the square root of 5 times the square root of 2, which is the square root of 10, minus, same thing here, 4, square root of 40. And then I look and I go, can I break that down? Well, I can. This is 4 times 10. So the, the 5 is right there on the square root of 10. And this would be the square root of 4, which is 2. 2 times 8, or 2 times 4 is 8, on the square root of 10. Well, these two can be combined together so that my final answer is negative 3 on the square root of 10. Then down here, I have FOIL going on. So I'm going to multiply these first two together. So it's going to give me 12 on the square root of 30. Outside is going to give me 20 on the square root of 18. Inside is going to give me negative 6 on the square root of 50. And last is going to give me negative 10 on the square root of 30. Well, I can look. 30 can't be broken down because it's 5 times 6 or 15 times 2 and I can't get the square root of either one of those. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine that one and that one. So I have 2 on the square root of 30. And then these actually can be broken down. So I have 9 times 2 or 3. So 3 times 20 is 60 on the square root of 2. And then I would have 25 times 2 and 5 times 6 because the square root of 25 is 5, is 30 on the square root of 2. So these two can be combined. So I have 2 on the square root of 30 
plus 30 on the square root of 2. All right, so that's section 11.2. Then you moved on to section 11.3, which was radical equations. So on this particular one, you are learning to solve for unknowns. So I have the square root of 3b minus 2 plus 19 equals 24. Go ahead and do that problem out. And then I have the square root of 3r plus 2 equals 2 on the square root of 3. Do those and then come back to the video. All right, first thing I'm going to do is subtract 19 from both sides. So I have the square root of 3b minus 2 is equal to uh, 5. I'm going, that whole thing is underneath the square root, so I'm going to square both sides to get rid of the square root. So I have 3b minus 2 equals 25. I'm going to add the 2, so I have 3b equals 27. When I divide, I find out that b is equal to 9. On this one, I can't get rid of anything. All I have left is the square root, so I'm going to go ahead and square both sides, which is going to give me 3r plus 2. When I square the 2, I get a 4. When I square the square root, I get a 3, because the square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is 3. So I have 3r plus 2 equals 12. I'm going to subtract, which is going to give me a 10, and r is going to give me 10 over 3. All right, let's do one more of these, and then we'll move on to the next section. Okay, go ahead and do that out and come back. All right, I need to move this part over to the other side to get rid of everything except for the square root. So I'm going to have positive s plus 3 over there. So I'm going to square both sides. When I square this side, I get that. But guys, be careful here because when you square that, you have to do FOIL on it. When you do FOIL on that, you're going to get s squared plus 6s plus 9. Now I'm going to take everything over to one side because I have a square there. So I have plus 2s and I'm going to subtract that. So that's going to give me um, a minus 8. And then I'm going to factor that. s plus 4 and s minus 2, and I'm going to have to solve it out. So I set it both equal to 0, and I get s is equal to negative 4, and s is equal to positive 2. Well, I always have to plug it back in because I don't know whether they'll both work. So when I plug it back in, you'll find out that the negative 4 does not work, and so you would eliminate that out. All right, that's section 11.3. 11.4 was where you started talking about the Pythagorean theorem which, remember, is how to find the unknown parts of a right triangle. So go ahead and do this one out. 30 squared plus 40 squared, because these are both the legs of the right triangle, and the leg squared plus the leg squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared. So you have 900 plus 1600 is equal to c squared, or 2,500 is equal to c squared, or c, when I take the square root of that, is 50. So that is the measurement of the hypotenuse. All right, let's do one more. Sometimes they give you a leg, and they give you the hypotenuse, and they want to know the other leg. Well, you still set it up the same way. The leg squared plus the leg squared is equal to the hypotenuse, but the unknown part is in a different location. So this is going to be 16 plus b squared is equal to 144. I'm going to subtract the 16, which is going to give me 128. Well, when I take the square root of it, I know it can be broken down into the square root of 4 times the square root of 32. Square root of 4 is 2, so it's 2 on the square root of 32, but then 32 can be broken down. So I have 2 
times the square root of 16 times the square root of 2. So the square root of 16 is 4. 4 times 2 is 8, so it's 8 on the square root of 2. you got to break it all the way down. Occasionally, they'll just give you letters. When they give you letters, know that the hypotenuse is always going to be your C. So if they say A is equal to the square root of 75, B is equal to the square root of 6, and C is my unknown. So when I set it up, these are my legs, this is my hypotenuse. So the square root of 75 squared plus the square root of 6 squared is equal to C squared. So the square root of 75 squared is 75. Square root of 6 squared is 6. So I find that my hypotenuse is 81. Well, I've got to take the square root of that, because that's c squared, so c is equal to 9. Technically, it's plus or minus 9, but we can't have a measurement that's a negative 9. So we know that positive 9 is the last thing there. All right, that was section 11.4. I can look in, okay. Then we have 11.5, which was where you learned the distance formula. So if you're given any two points, you should be able to find the distance between them by using this theorem. So let's say I want to know between 0 and negative 4 and 3, 2. Go ahead and do that and come back to the video. D is equal to the square root of 0 minus 3 squared plus negative 4 minus 2 squared. So I have negative 3 squared is 9, and negative 6 squared is 36. So this is going to give me the square root of 45, which is 9 times 5, or 3 on the square root of 5. And that's going to be my distance between those two. Sometimes you have to work backwards. Sometimes they give you the distance, and you've got to solve for an x or a y. So we'll do one of those problems as well. So the distance is equal to 10. The points are 4, negative 1, and a, 5. So I plug it in. d is equal to 4 minus a squared plus negative 1 minus 5 squared. Well, to get rid of the square root, I'm going to have to square both sides, so that's 100, is equal to 4 minus a squared plus negative 6 squared, which is 36. I'm going to go ahead and solve for the a, so I'm going to subtract the 36 and get 64 is equal to 4 minus a squared. Now I have to take the square root of both sides, when I take the square root of 64, it's plus or minus 8. So I'm going to have two equations. Um, I'm hoping I'm not right outside of where you can see. 8 is equal to 4 minus a, and negative 8 is equal to 4 minus a. I'm going to subtract, so I'm going to get 4 is equal to negative a, or a is equal to negative 4. That's one answer. I'm going to subtract, I get negative 12 is equal to negative a, going to divide through by negative 1, so a is equal to 12. That's the other answer. All right, then we moved on to 11.6, and this is where we talked about similar triangles. This was the last thing that you had homework on. Um, remember, for two triangles to be similar, they have to have congruent angles and proportional sides. Um, I know that this side over here is little f because it's opposite f. This is little d because it's opposite d. Little e because it's opposite e. And the same thing over here. And they tell me that triangle A, B, C is similar to triangle D, E, F. So I can mark my angles. A is going to be congruent to D. E is going to be congruent to B, and F is going to be congruent 